cool. They're much, cool, they're much uh, warmer than these. And that's partly to do with the nature of their structure. So there's a lot to learn from that. So the three things, the albedo, the thermal mass and the emittance of the roof, are, are the things to look for. Okay, now what? How, where does all this urban heat island come from? It's from the sun. Primarily. We think, a lot of people think, and there are other things, the, the air conditioners themselves, there's cars, there's factories and all that stuff. The issue is which are the most important? Does anyone have a guess? Which, which, which contributions to the heating of a city are the most important? The sun. The sun, by far. And just to get you an idea of the magnitude, it, now it does depend on how dense the population is. Very few people understand these matters, but it's... So, if you, if you have a new urban development on those outer suburbs in Melbourne, say, or the outer suburbs, western parts of Sydney or wherever, central coast or somewhere, now, typically we, we've got data that it's, it's very easy, most urban developments will knock the albedo down at least by minus 0.1, possibly more in a lot of cases, depending on what was there in the ground in the first place, whether it was an open farm or a forest or whatever. But this is a, a ballpark, fairly reasonable estimate. Now that tells you that you're getting 23.2 megawatts per square metre of additional heating from the sun. This is based on the average insulation in Sydney. On the other hand, if you look at the power needs for a typical square kilometre of, of urban development in, in Australia, you need about 4.2 megawatts per square kilometre. Now, that is a rather large difference. So, by the way, all your power usage doesn't necessarily... Uh, that, that's the power usage. So that all ends up as heat. Electricity ends up as heat once we're finished with it. Whether we're driving machines, lighting, whatever we do, it all ends up as heat. So we can think of this as two sources of heat. There's additional heat, of course, from the power station. That's another story which I, I don't want to go into. It's very controversial. We touch on it in the book. Where you locate your power sources... So there's a big push to say, let's have all the rooftops coated with solar cells, let's put little gas-fired boilers in there, uh, sorry, converters here, there and everywhere in the city. I urge you to think twice about this. There's not only limits from power control and smart grids and everything else, there are limits on the urban heat island. And if you put too many solar cells and too much power sources within your city, you, you exacerbate this problem. I won't say any more, but someone might like to touch on that later. Um, so, how do you... Now, it's possible, it's quite easy, in fact, if your urban co building codes, we don't have much urban planning in this area yet, but it's an important area, then if you were to rise by 0.1, then you actually get net cooling, and you that outlast the power from heat for very substantially until you get up to 17,000 people per square kilometre, and you're looking at Hong Kong and places like that, to achieve those numbers. So, this is just food for thought, if you like. Now getting into some science. Uh, what we call spectral selectivity is the, the, the optical characteristics of a coating such that it will achieve the thermal goals that we want. And there are two types of extremes here. One, you're all aware of solar thermal collectors. That is, this is reflectance. So that, what I've shown is two ideals, if you like, limits. So a perfect solar absorber for a solar thermal collector would do this, that black line. This is the black body or the thermal radiation, so you're tracking it all because uh, it's 100% reflectance or very low emittance. This is the transition point where we go from the solar energy to black body radiation. And I've just got any... Forget about the orange line for the minute. Now here is the green line which is the exact opposite. That is the ideal cool roof paint. So what you're doing when you're cooling, you want the exact opposite of what you want on your solar collector. So you want a very, low, a very uh, high emittance, very low reflectance, and a very high solar reflectance. Now you can go further, and I said, hinted at, you can do some tricks in the visible. So you reduce the solar, you enhance your solar absorption slightly, but you still get colour. But because uh, around 50% of the solar energy is here, you still keep things pretty cool. 
And this is an extreme example which we helped develop with BASF some years ago. Uh, this is a traditional carbon black, very high solar absorptance. Here is what's called a limousine black, and what you notice is that it's very absorbing in the visible, but quite reflecting in the infrared. And if you compare, put these two out in the sun, this one will probably get to 70 or 80. A typical, this one might get to 35. And if that was a roof, then big difference. And unfortunately, a lot of people are you hide your head in shame if you're doing it, but if you're having black pavement, black roof tiles, it's becoming a big fad at the moment, you are exacerbating the urban heat island problem. Okay, now let's get on towards some of the science behind some of the technology and the night, because this is the area that's least understood. This, I think, Mary, I got by her some time ago, I'll just put her up again. Um, this Somewhere the Southern Cross, so it's our sky, there's a little sailing boat down there, it's not the moon or anything. And uh, we're talking about using that as a heat sink. Basically what this is about is using the sky or the atmosphere, in fact it's not the atmosphere, it's, it's what's behind the atmosphere, space, that we're using as a heat sink. How does it work? Well the fundamentals, uh, as uh, our friend in the movie we just heard about, uh, <coughs> Al Gore talked a bit about this del rather delicate thing called the atmosphere. And what people don't understand is the atmosphere does two things. It sends radiation in, and which is this incoming arrow, but it also lets radiation out. And the important thing for life on Earth is that uh, the amount going out is a bit bigger than the amount going in. And this is a 24 hour average over the whole globe for the amount of energy due to thermal radiation coming off the Earth, the big one, and the smaller one is what's coming back. Now, where's it coming from? It's coming from... Where, where's this incoming radiation from? The sun. Sorry? The sun. No! This is from the gases in the atmosphere. This is the greenhouse. We need a greenhouse. We talk about greenhouse as a dirty word now. It ain't a dirty word, it's a good word. It keeps, life on Earth doesn't exist without a greenhouse effect. But we cannot let it... It's a very delicate balance. So if we shift these numbers the wrong way, we run into problems. And that's what the CO2 problem, as I'll show you in the next slide, is about. If you can put it into context, here's a number. This is a 24-hour average of the solar radiation. It's, it's actually around about half this. But when you sum it all up, you get the nice thermal balance on Earth. But of course, if we do nasty things in here, we create problems. And that's what the key focus is at the moment. To get a, a, a scientific perspective, perspective on that, these are the, there's three gases actually, I'll show the third one on the next slide, that's the solar radiation, this is our two and a half microns or so, this is the absorption of the two trace gases, water vapour and CO2, water vapour is a greenhouse gas, much more abundant than CO2, and that's why CO2 is a problem because small change, we're talking much more water, so a little change in water still have a big effect, but, and that's what Angus will look a bit more at. But um, CO2 also is an important contribution to the thermal balance. And if we were to cut out all the CO2, we'd have big problems as well. So, but it's th this area here where the atmosphere is most transparent, and that's where radiation essentially can get out into space. It's not perfectly transparent. It's about 87% if you go straight up. If you don't go straight up, this is it. Now, this is a... For those who know science, this, is a, this unit here is just effectively a measure of the radiation coming in from all sides onto a point from the sky. It's what we call radiance. And this data is, uh, uh, I think it was taken in Florida, anyway, which had a similar conditions to Sydney, actually, when it was taken. What it says is several things. These, this, this is what we call the Planck radiation curve. So it's a black body. So if the atmosphere was black, which it is largely, this tells us here that the atmosphere is largely black at these wavelengths. Only here is it transparent. Now what this graph says is it's more transparent if you go straight up than 60 and 75, which is quite simple because uh, uh, as you, the atmosphere gets thicker as you go looking out that way or straight up. And so it absorbs more. And 
things that absorb more radiate more. This is the incoming radiation. What's interesting is this little bump in the middle, that is ozone. So ozone sits right in the middle of what we call the sky window. But the important point is the atmosphere is largely black, except for that very narrow re region which lies between about 8 and 13 microns. But just to show you it's real, we take a, Angus had a little, uh, we have a remote measuring you know, infrared thermometer. You point it straight at something local, it's 23.9. You point it up at the sky, it's minus 21.6. That's not a real reading, by the way, because it, the emittance of the sky is actually much different to what this is set on, but it tells you the sky is pretty cold. And if you point it near the horizon, it's just near zero. So there are big changes if you go from up there to down here. And they're all cooler than the local ambient. At what time of day? Uh, what time was that angle? So, that was about midday. Thank you. Okay, um, I've just touched on, humidity is very important in this business, and the sort of technology we're looking at tend to work better when you've got drier conditions, but uh, if we can even up in Singapore, if the right side of the building, we can do okay, and it's one of the worst places on earth for radiative cooling. Um, but unfortunately the building working on that of R, R equals 3 makes it tougher. Anyway, uh, this shows a slightly different approach. This is instead of angles of instance, we're looking at different humidity levels. This is the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere in terms of a, a column of water. And uh, places out in the West Australian desert and Arizona and so on like this. So Sydney is somewhere in the middle here. And very humid places up higher. So uh, this shows you that uh, more radiation comes in as you increase the humidity. Now, coming back to surfaces, um, there soon be time I hang it over to Angus, we're going reasonably well here. There are two, key ty two interesting types of surfaces one can use in this game, and just what one you use for what job depends on what, what temperature you, essentially you're, you want to operate at and what sort of system. But a lot of the early research focused on this guy, which is a, a, a surface that uh, radiates very strongly only in the sky window and reflects everything else. Now what's that doing? It's, it's saying virtually no radiation is going to be absorbed by this surface. That's an ideal. We, don't, we get close to that, but not perfect. Uh, so the incoming radiation is going to be largely reflected, except and the only outgoing radiation is that that goes into outer space. Now it's not as perfect as that, because ozone and other stuff's there, but you can get a lot of it out. Now, in theory, if you have a surface like that, you can get very cold. But, of course, if you just put it out in the atmosphere, you've got other problems. What are they? Oh, heating from the local... Yeah, the air and everything else. So you have to do some tricks, which Angus will talk about, to, to stop the incoming convection. So there are in interesting engineering issues, but you can go a long way with these sort of things. And there are a variety of them. And some of we've had papers on recently involved special nanoparticles. The other type is just a very black body radiator. And so there are two extremes. Just when you use one or the other, or the things that approach these, of course, we never get to these limits. Um, depends what you want to do. But just to give you an idea what you can do with rather simple and abundant uh, materials, uh, these are two nanoparticles, silicon dioxide, you may have heard of. Silicon carbide, you also may have heard of on tools and other things. It turns out that nanoparticles of silicon carbide um, have an absorption band which lies entirely within, this is the sky window, this in fact even misses the, uh, misses the ozone band. And so silicon carbide, interestingly enough, astronomers have been studying most of the literature on this material is in the astronomy literature because a lot of interstellar dust is silicon carbide nanoparticles and astronomers were able to see this because of Earth-based infrared astronomy uh, was not perturbed by anything virtually. This is one of the. This radiates where the atmosphere is most clear. Uh, silicon dioxide it does hit the ozone band, but it's still pretty much in the sky window. It has another uh, absorption band out here, but the Planck radiation spectrum is weak there, so uh, 